Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all in our audience, wherever you are in the world today. I'm Doug Silliman, the president of the Arab Gulf States Institute in Washington, and I want to welcome everybody to the second day of Petro Diplomacy 2022, Gulf countries on the front line of energy security. Yesterday, in our first two sessions of the conference, we looked at the impact of the Russian invasion of Ukraine and the OPEC Plus decision in October on oil markets. We talked about how the Biden administration has used uh, unconventional methods, including uh, drawing down the U.S. strategic petroleum reserves to try to moderate prices. Uh, we also looked in a second session at Russia's use of natural gas as a weapon in Europe and the impact of that on natural gas markets around the world, particularly in the global south and in Asia. Now, originally, we had planned to do a session this morning focused on hydrogen and other renewable resources, but we've instead decided that we need to overlay geopolitics, national politics, and the issues of war and peace on the very good analysis we got of oil and gas markets yesterday to give people a full picture of the integration of politics and economics as we go forward to try to deal with these issues as countries, businesses, and just plain citizens. So. Without further ado, I want to explain, again, how we're going to run this morning's session. This session is going to be on the record. It'll be recorded for uh, rebroadcast next week on AGSIW's website. Uh, you in the audience will be in listen-only mode, but we very much want your participation. So we ask that if, that if you have questions or comments to make, you use the Q&A function at the bottom of your Zoom screen, and our moderator will incorporate those into the conversation as they go forward. So we have decided in this last session of Petro Diplomacy 2022 to pull together the real intellectual brain trust of AGSIW across a range of issues to make sure that we can give you um, a very balanced discussion of the issues that are affecting the Gulf, the United States, and the world right now. So we have four of our favorite people to discuss this morning. Uh, first, we have Kate Durian, who you met yesterday moderating the oil session. She is a non-resident fellow for AGSIW, but has worked with MIS, the Energy Institute, the World Energy Council, and the IEA in the past. And she wrote for this conference the very good scene setter that I recommended to you yesterday, uh, Gulf Countries on the Front Line of Energy Security. Uh, you can find that at AGSIW's website, agsiw.org. Next, we've got Kristen smith Duan, a senior resident scholar at AGSIW. Uh, she looks at uh, the politics and society of the Gulf and the Middle East. She has a PhD from Harvard University and has also taught at the George Washington University and at Georgetown. We have Robert Mogilnicki, uh, another AGSIW senior resident scholar. He is uh, the director of our Looking East, the China Gulf Initiative. Uh, he is, uh, was named by the Middle East Policy Council last year as one of the 40 under 40 uh, voices with great influence on the Middle East, and he has a uh, DPhil from Magdalen College at the University of Oxford. And moderating this conversation is Hussein Ibish, uh, another senior resident scholar at AGSIW. Uh, Hussein has got a PhD from the University of Massachusetts at Amherst and wrote what I think thus far is the best framework for analyzing what's happening with OPEC, or the oil markets, and relations with the United States, why the U.S.-Saudi crisis is so bad and so unnecessary. Again, you can find this on AGSIW's website, and I think that you will find this very useful in the future uh, to put a frame and organize discussions and thinking around these very crucial issues. So without any further ado, Hussein, I give thank, you the microphone. Uh, thank you so much, Doug. It's great to be here. Uh, I agree. I mean, I think this is sort of a, a remarkably robust dream panel, and it's great that it's in-house. So this is a wonderful thing for AGSIW. And um, I, I'm honored to be here with my colleagues uh, chairing the discussion today. Um, what we're looking at is the, a, a crisis between uh, or within the framework of U.S.-Saudi relations um, that was a uh, proximate cause of which was the decision of the OPEC plus sort of de facto cartel, OPEC plus other non-OPEC oil producers, uh, mainly led on the one side by Saudi Arabia and on the other side by Russia, 
in a, a kind of an emergency meeting on October 5th, they decided to institute production cuts uh, in order to stop the sinking of the price of oil per barrel and uh, hopefully, according to the Saudis, uh, get it back up to around $80 per barrel, and they said they hoped possibly to maintain it at $90 per barrel. Um, this kicked off a firestorm of protest in Washington. It was bipartisan. There are a lot of people out there who are saying this is only Democrats, it's only the Biden administration. That's quite untrue. I would refer you to Charles Grassley. Uh, for example, if you want to see a senior Republican who was um, very, very angry, uh, and there are many others, uh, and uh, a, a kind of a shocked response uh, in Saudi Arabia. In other words, uh, Americans are outraged that Saudi Arabia is not apparently not cooperating uh, with the United States on energy pricing. Saudi Arabia is taken aback that its uh, decisions on, on its, uh, something so crucial to its uh, fundamental economy and national security are being um, uh, treated in this manner in Washington. And, and from their point of view, um, it's nothing new or particularly remarkable that they would want oil at 80 or even $90 a barrel, because for many years they spoke about $100 a barrel as being a, uh, a reasonable uh, price, and uh, that was often acceptable to Washington. What all of this comes in the context of is the Ukraine war, of course. Uh, there, there's a, not only is there a fundamental divergence in perceptions, there's also a fundamental lack of trust. But let's deal with the perceptions first for a second. Um, the, the basic disagreement is about the impact of the um, falling price of oil on the Saudi economy and Saudi development plans, even including things like Vision 2030. The American position is that it really wasn't that bad and there was no need to uh, rush and precipitately act to cut production and keep prices up or push prices back up a little. Um, the Saudi position is that no, in fact, they had to act right away and they had no time to waste, which is why they called that a not regularly scheduled meeting uh, in early October and why they acted the way they did. So one of the first things we have to do is evaluate uh, the relative merits and the uh, and and of, of those two analyses, and and ask ourselves why do these two countries have such a different opinion about what you know I mean it's speculative to some extent but it's not that speculative there's an element of of, of um, arithmetic objectivity to it. Um, how important was it to Saudi Arabia to staunch the, the um, uh, lowering of the price per barrel? Um, and, and so that's, I think, something we really need to look at. But it's not just that disagreement. And it's not just the fact that uh, the West in general and people in the United States view this dispute through the lens of the Ukraine war and have concluded that because the production cut was done in coordination with Saudi Arabia, with, with, by Saudi Arabia in coordination with Russia, and because it will benefit the Russian economy as well as the Saudi and other oil-producing economies, and because it gave a public stage to President Putin and to uh, Russia to break out also a little bit of its, um, not just this, the pressure of sanctions, but also the pressure of international isolation, that this meant that uh, Saudi Arabia was effectively siding with Russia in the war with Ukraine. King Salman himself yesterday told the Shura Council in Riyadh that he is uh, aghast and amazed that anyone would think that. And uh, the Saudis moved quickly to transfer $400 million, a much bigger amount than they offered in the past to Ukraine to help them, um, you know, in, in effect with the war effort, at least to, to manage their current um, crisis. Um, so they're trying to demonstrate that that's not true. But um, many, if not most people in Washington have taken it that way. And I think a lot of people in Europe have also taken it that way. On top of that, 
it comes in the context of a growing breach of trust between the parties. Uh, over the past 15 or 20 years, certainly throughout the uh, second Obama term, uh, things became pretty uh, uh, critical between Saudi Arabia and uh, the United States. Uh, they improved slightly at the beginning of the Trump administration, but really didn't fare very well under the Trump administration. I think people forget that one of the great inflection points here from the Saudi point of view was the lack of an American response to the Iranian missile attacks on Aramco oil facilities at Abqeq and Khores in September of 2019. Uh, and that happened under Trump. So any, I think any idea that uh, Republicans in general, or Donald Trump in particular, is the answer to their fundamental concerns about relations with Washington, were answered in the negative back there. Um, on the other hand, um, there are many American grievances, especially among Democrats, with Saudi Arabia, uh, in particularly this conflation of the Saudis with Donald Trump, the extremely bitter memories of the murder of Jamal Khashoggi, uh, a man who had many friends and admirers in Washington, and myself included, and many, many other people. And this simply sat very badly with the, with the many Americans and with the United States. And there's a, a general feeling that justice has not been done and probably never will be in this case. Um, and in addition to that, a bunch of other grievances involving the war in Yemen, involving other human rights abuses, involving the idea that Saudi Arabia, along with other traditional U.S. allies in the Middle East, including Israel and the UAE, are, are, are going too far in strategic diversification, getting too close to Russia and especially to China, and are trying to um, hone this middle ground between Washington and its great power adversaries. Um, I would simply say that we would be remiss if we didn't throw in the uh, upcoming likely visit by President Xi Jinping, or party chairman Xi Jinping, however we should refer to him, uh, of China to Riyadh, uh, which is another, which is expected sometime in the coming, I don't know, five, six months, something like that. No one really knows, but everyone still thinks it's going to happen. That could be another very difficult moment between uh, Riyadh and Washington, because both, both because of optics, he's likely to be greeted uh, with pomp and circumstance that President Biden was not when he went to Jeddah. Uh, even though President Biden didn't want pomp and circumstance, people are still going to note it, and they're still going to say, well, they don't like us. And on deliverables, uh, where uh, China and, um, and uh, Saudi Arabia have just signed another energy uh, cooperation agreement that includes another pledge to cooperate on uh, the development of, of nuclear energy, which is bound to raise hackles in the United States. That, that was uh, information released, I believe, again yesterday uh, by the Saudi foreign ministry. So there is this great dearth of trust on both sides. And neither side is giving the other the benefit of the doubt. And because they fundamentally disagreed on whether the production cut was necessary, questioned each other's motives, and wondered why the other side was doing what they were doing and reacting the way they were reacting, this is a full-blown crisis that sort of emerges without a, a, uh, a proximate cause that has, let's, let's say, without, without a, um, uh, you know, an objective correlative, uh, TSLE would have said. You know, in other words, the, the, the reaction of the characters doesn't match the action on the stage. It doesn't make sense that people would be behaving this way just based on what's happening. There is a whole backstory that I've tried to flesh out a little bit. So let's tackle this. Um, we'll we'll invite your questions via the uh, Q&A function uh, as well. We'll get to them a little later on. And uh, with that, I'd like to throw the first question out to, to Kate uh, and ask her to please fill us in on the details behind this dispute about the production cut and pricing and all of that. Um, thank you, Hussein. Well, firstly, the OPEC Plus meeting was actually scheduled for October 5, but it wasn't scheduled to be an in-person meeting, which would be the first time in two years because they hadn't met in person in Vienna. Uh, and they sort of sprung it on people a week before um, the date. 
So I think it wasn't so much the decision to cut quotas by 2 million barrels a day, which was sort of the headline number. Um, it was the messaging. It was the way in which I think they wanted to make a splash. They wanted to shock the market. They wanted to show that they were actually in charge. And um, even if the actual production cut isn't going to be as high as 2 million barrels a day, they didn't really explain it. Uh, it took a question to Prince um, uh, Abdelaziz bin Salman, the energy minister of Saudi Arabia, for him to explain that actually, because a lot of uh, members within OPEC and non-OPEC uh, are not producing at quota because they have uh, constraints, capacity constraints, because of lack of investment in the past or because of internal conflict, as is the case in, in, in Libya, um, and, you know, natural decline in places like Angola, uh, problems in Nigeria, etc., that the actual production cut would be more like a million to 1.1 million. And if you heard our session yesterday, um, analysts think it would probably be more like 800,000 barrels a day, which isn't really, you know, a huge cut when you consider that Chinese demand is very weak at the moment because of COVID-induced lockdowns. So I think the political message was not so much in the decision to cut production uh, because demand is already decelerating. We've seen the IEA, OPEC, and the Energy Information Administration in the U.S. have all um, revised down their demand estimates for the rest of this year and, and the next. Uh, we also heard yesterday that Russian production, which has held relatively stable, we've only seen about 400,000 barrels a day decline, uh, in Russian Russian production, that it may decline by 1.5 million barrels a day in the first quarter of next year. And one of the main concerns, I think, by the IEA, by the US, is that by cutting production, they're preventing stocks from being replenished. Um, you know, a lot of the industrialized world, the OECD countries, have been drawing down their inventories because of this release from strategic stocks that was ordered by the U.S. and by the uh, International Energy Agency. And stocks are at the moment below the five-year average, which is the benchmark that OPEC uses to determine how much the market needs. Uh, and I think that's one of the main bones of contention. But I think the fact that it was done in person, that it was, um, that it made such a big splash was where the, the, that's where the politics came in, as opposed to the actual, you know, fundamentals uh, may well justify a production cut because you don't have the same kind of demand. But of course, if you're worried about recession and that impacting demand and, and global economic slowdown, as the IMF has warned, then you're basically precipitating it by cutting production. Um, I think it could have been done a bit more subtly. Um, you could have tweaked the market. But I think the message is, you know, we are in charge. You tell us you don't want our oil. You want independence. You don't want foreign oil. And at the same time, now you're begging us to increase production. Uh, at the end of the day, OPEC's mandate is to serve the interests of its members uh, and keep prices and production levels at a certain level that doesn't um, impact sort of you know, that doesn't cause a shortage but the problem is you have a lot of geopolitical aspects that could impact market balances for example libya is back up again but it may not be because politically the situation in libya hasn't stabilized you've got angola is not coming back anytime soon you've got venezuela under sanctions and even if president biden wants to lift sanctions i think he faces opposition even from within his own party to lift sanctions against Venezuela because of human rights, other issues. Venezuela can't produce very much anyway because their industry has been decimated. Iran is still under sanctions, not likely to come back again. If it does, that's another million, 1.23 million barrels a day addition. That's not coming back. So if you have any disruption, the market's going to be tight and you risk going into deficit again. So I think that's where that's where you might run into trouble, and it remains to be seen what happens. And as, as Hussein said in, in his paper, the world has been split, and the way that Washington views, or, and the West is viewing relations with other countries is through the prism of, this, of their attitude towards the Ukraine crisis. And I don't know if it's fair to say that the Arab Gulf states have actually taken sides, but at the end of the day, it was a very hard-won alliance with, with Russia that Prince Abdelaziz was basically... Um, he orchestrated it. You know, Ali Naimi didn't. I remember walking with him in Vienna years ago, and he said, you know, if the Russians want $20 oil, I'll give them $20 oil. 
that was when there was a sort of confrontational um, relationship between Washington and uh, between Moscow and Riyadh. That's changed, and I think they want to hold on to that alliance. Um, Rather this is than, this was the result of the of the competition or price war, whatever you want to call it, in twenty twenty. That was before. No, it predates oh, that okay. twenty twenty one. Yeah. All right. So, that's my. Well, yeah, that's very helpful because what you've done is you've brought us into the political register really nicely, uh, and I think I I should throw out there uh, something that I didn't mention among billions of things I might have said that I didn't in my in my long opening is that it's maybe not a coincidence that the you know, four to six weeks that the administration was asking uh, Riyadh to wait before they took any decision uh, corresponds exactly with the U.S. political calendar, with the midterms, right? And that in addition, um, it would appear that there is no bigger correlation between uh, voting and an economic factor than with oil pricing. Uh, Oil prices have more of an impact on the way people vote for or against incumbents than anything else politically in the United States. Um, So that perhaps isn't coincidental. On the other hand, even though so many Democrats are accusing um, Riyadh of of, uh, deliberately interfering uh, in the U.S. domestic political scene, I'm I'm very skeptical that they that they were uh, obsessed with with the um, with with the more interested in the U.S. political calendar than in their own um, spreadsheets, economic spreadsheets. Um, but let me then throw the political question to Kristen and ask you to kind of give us a sense of how you think this is all playing out domestically in Saudi Arabia. Um, you know the politics of this decision, the reaction, the whole flap, and all of the surrounding circumstances, or as much as you want to tackle now. Thanks, Hussein. Um, Let me start by putting a little bit of my own uh, framing on it for how uh, I see this whole moment sort of exploding the way that it did. Uh, And I I think to understand that, we we do need to look at the, the context which you've done a lot of setup, but I, I think it's just sort of extraordinary uh, this very moment. Because if you look at uh, the moment that we're in globally, we're in the midst of an energy transition, which we all know uh, moving towards a more decarbonized future. We have the COP meetings coming up uh, just here in November, just to underline that um, we are in a, a global midst of a contested global transition. Uh, in power distribution, um, you know, it's often written about now that we're, we're talking about moving from a sort of unipolar system to one that's more multipolar. Uh, and of course, this contest is being played out very directly on the fields of Ukraine right now. I think that's very directly linked to uh, this whole um, idea about w- what is the future uh, global political system going to look like. Mm-hmm. And then on top of that, um, I think it's important to to recognize that this also has to do with the, the nature of what politics are going to look like uh, moving ahead in the future. And this is also contested. Um, you know, there's a lot of anxiety uh, in the United States right now about its democratic future. Yeah. Um, we know that we're moving, and this, this affects very much the oil markets too, to um, politics where states are getting much more interventionist into markets. Um, and basically all of these different transitions, um, or this decision that the Saudis uh, and OPEC Plus made right at this moment, um, hits and cuts against all of these contested transitions. And so I think there's there's no uh, wonder why it's really exploded in the way that it has mm-hmm. and why also we can get all of these different interpretations about what the Saudi motivations were in the sense, you know, is it does it have to do with their siding, uh, with a more multi, multipolar future? They're trying to bring the United States down. Does it have to do with... Uh, you know, the energy transition and their contest of that. And all of these things are contested. Um, and they're contested on the global level and they're contested within our political systems, which is why that whole issue that you just brought up of the elections uh, comes into play as well. Um, so I think uh, when, when I try to get down and really look at what uh, Saudi, you know, from what, and this is my own analysis just of, from watching Saudi Arabia very closely, 
uh, and the moment that it's going through, um, I think the first recognition has to be that this first energy transition is obviously for all of the Gulf states, something that hits them in a much more fundamental way than even it does us. All of us are concerned about our energy security. But for these states, the, the oil uh, and this transition and how they manage it is, is uh, it's, it's, it has to do with their very ability to, to survive, I guess, and, and to secure their future. So, and, and I think um, if we look at Saudi Arabia in particular, I mean, they've obviously taken steps to very much link now their energy policy to this big transition that they're doing inside of their country of Vision 2030. I mean, this is right on the very institutional level. You can see this. Now the chairman of Aramco is also the chairman of the PIF, right. which is the body that is uh, doing the investments to help Saudi Arabia achieve this energy diversification. So I think, and I know that Robert's going to talk much more to this uh, in a minute, so I won't get into that. But obviously that element is, is really forefront, I think, in the Saudi decision making, that they have to take that into consideration and they need uh, kind of high revenues to drive that transition. Mm -hmm. um, and I think the other thing that's going on in, in Saudi Arabia right now is a, a tremendous political transition to a more centralized system in addition to a social transition. Uh, and all of this is being captured in, in a real nationalist uh, mood. And I think um, we can kind of see that uh, where Saudi Arabia has a lot more ambition to assert itself on the global stage uh, to be relevant, um, to have its interests and its um, its presence really to be out there on the global stage. Uh, and I think it's not surprising then that in this area of oil where they have the most leverage, that that's where they're going to really, you know, apply their, their power. Um, and we saw that, you know, a couple of years ago against Russia, actually, when we had that... Um, basically takedown of the Russians at the at the at this very uh, difficult time of the beginning of the coronavirus pandemic uh, when there was basically a challenge over market share and, you know, Saudi Arabia used their power to basically assert that we are the ones that are going to have the dominant voice on, on where, you know, OPEC plus is going. Um, and I think um, in a way, and because of the way that um, basically that, um, that it's been described here of how the Saudis... Um, how Kate described how this was carried out, I, I think we can kind of see this a little bit like a Saudi declaration of independence, that we are going to be asserting, you know, what our interests are in the oil market. Um, and, you know, I, I think, I think th that, that element of it also has to be taken into account. Great. Uh, I think Kate had something she wanted to add before we go to Robert. Yeah, that, that battle for market share in 2020, that was really more about the timing of the production cuts. I think the Russians were worried, and since we're in Washington, I think it's just worth mentioning, the Russians were worried about ceding market share to U.S. shale producers mm -hmm. or U.S. independent producers. And that was really the dispute. It wasn't about the need to cut. I mean, obviously, because uh, demand was down by 30%. But it was more about um, having to, you know, not giving, um, you know, not ceding market share to, to, to U.S. producers. And that, that was the, the sort of the crux of it. But yes, at the end of the day, the Saudis got their way and said, OK, we're going to do 9.7 million. Uh, and then they had the, you know, they had another dispute over baselines. But, you know, if you look at it now, the baselines that were set for both Saudi Arabia and Russia equally are very unrealistic. Saudi Arabia can produce 11.5 million. Uh, uh, Russia can't, even before this current crisis. Okay, so uh, having gotten uh, into the econo economics of it and then into the politics of it, let's swing to the exact kind of nexus of the two in Saudi Arabia, which is the question of how all of this um, volatility uh, in the um, energy market and where the price was going and where it's going now, uh, you know, and all of that. How does that impact Saudi Arabia's development strategies, Robert? How does it play into the longer term plans that Saudi Arabia has that Kristen was referring to, this very um, ambitious, very dramatic and extremely urgent um, push to transition uh, away from total dependence on hydrocarbon. Uh, well, thank you, Hussein. Uh, it strikes me that the, um, the instruments being used to influence energy prices obviously have political and economic dimensions. 
Um, but the urgency of the strategic objectives behind the recent moves that we're talking about today and are the subject of our panel seem to me to be more political in nature for the White House and uh, economic in nature for the Saudis. So what I'd like to do with these opening remarks is uh, pick up on what you mentioned in your blog, Hussein, and what Kristen referred to in her comments about the ambitious but at times also fragile development and um, economic transformation underway in Saudi Arabia. And this, I should add, is not intended to reinforce the Saudi claim or assertion that the move was primarily or purely an economic decision, uh, but I do think there are important economic considerations. And I'll mention three of them. Uh, the first has to do with the role of energy markets for the fiscal health of uh, Saudi Arabia. The second has to do with the benefits of maintaining an oil-fueled fu oil uh, surplus. And finally, um, thinking about economic momentum, how all of these factors play into economic momentum um, and support Vision 2030 in Saudi Arabia. So for the first point, we have to keep in mind that the fiscal health of Saudi Arabia is still directly dependent upon um, upon energy markets. I looked at the Ministry of Finance's uh, latest budget documents, and we're looking at anywhere between 60 and 70 percent of the government's um, government revenue coming from the oil and gas sector. In 2021, that figure was 60 percent, but if we look at uh, the second quarter figures uh, from this year, that figure was pushing 70 percent, uh, closer to 67.5. Um, that's just the top line figures, too. That doesn't account for uh, government wages and other policies and injections of, of capital um, into, the, into the economy that then is recycled through the economy and uh, comes back in the form of taxes, which is we could think about as an indirect impact of oil revenues. And so that's the first point, that despite a significant, significant progress that we can point to in terms of uh, fiscal consolidation and economic diversification, uh, the introduction of new taxes, we're still talking about a, uh, an economy that is largely motivated and driven um, by a you know, robust energy market and also public sector revenues that are still um, primarily dependent upon uh, the energy sector. And how does this rank to other economic um, interests that Saudi Arabia might have, say, something along the lines of uh, generating and attracting FDI? Well, if we go back to 2021, FDI figures uh, reached about $19.3 billion for the year, but oil revenues were $148 billion for the year. Uh, and those were pretty conservative revenues. Just in the second quarter of this year, oil revenues were over $66 billion. So uh, we're talking about a completely different uh, order of magnitude in terms of when we compare you know, the economic interests attached to oil revenues for the government of Saudi Arabia and you know other economic interests like FDI, for example. I mean, then it brings me to the second point. When you have a uh, government revenues and a budget that is um, so dependent upon oil revenues, you need to maintain um, high oil prices in order to continue to enjoy uh, uh, budget surpluses. Estimates of the break-even price of oil for Saudi Arabia are around $70 per barrel. Um, some new estimates for 2023 uh, suggest that that figure may be around $76 uh, per barrel. So uh, if we look at where things stand now, uh, the Saudis can certainly manage uh, prices in the 80s. They don't want prices to go uh, down too far into the 70s or, or God forbid, below. Uh, I think higher uh, into the 90s would be a good place for them to be. Um, and where this leaves us moving forward is we're looking, as we look to 2023, um, figures from uh, budget officials already suggest that the Saudis are expecting smaller budget surpluses. Um, where I think it's just they're hoping to have about $2 billion or so for 2023, because in many respects, they've committed themselves to um, greater uh, expenditures for the year. And that gets to my third point, that there is a significant interest in Saudi Arabia in maintaining economic momentum. Um, I would say that the main reason behind this interest is that a number of the major mega projects and initiatives that have been launched in Saudi Arabia over the past couple of years are at the moment currently transitioning from the conceptual stage 
into the implementation stage. We have uh, the NEOM project, which is really picking up speed. Um, and I believe uh, they're just actually showing pictures of, of breaking ground on the line uh, on, on social media. We have a new national industrial strategy that was just announced within the past couple of days. A new airline, the second national, um, a second national carrier that is um, also uh, in the works. And maybe, uh, if we can believe some reports, there might be a third airline attached to NEOM. So these are just a couple of, the, uh, of a number of different initiatives that have emerged really just within the past couple of days. And these are incredibly expensive. Um, so I would say that all, these are some of the, the important economic interests that we do have to keep in mind uh, when we're thinking about this issue. Thank you. No, thanks so much, Robert. I, I think it's really important. And, and uh, what's fascinating is that while uh, all of that is kind of known in the United States, almost none of it has figured into the uh, most of the responses. Um, from the White House, from Congress, from uh, much of the media, et cetera. Um, the idea that uh, Saudi Arabia has more than its sort of immediate balance sheet uh, at stake here is not taken into consideration. At the same time, I, I detect a great deal of um, sort of, um, how, how should I put it, um, a, a tin ear um, quality to, to the Saudi approach to Washington, where they just don't seem to understand how uh, obvious responses um, to, to these moves uh, were, were inevitable <laughs> and were, were very predictable, and yet they still seem taken aback. Um, so I'd like to, to go back to Kristen for a second and ask you uh, how you think the nationalistic sentiments in Saudi Arabia are playing out? Because here it's very much a uh, becoming a question of national pride, of amour propre in the United States. Is the United States being played? Is the United States being taken advantage of? Is the United States being taken for granted? Is the United States being mistreated by uh, a, uh, a longstanding ally? Or even, as some Democrats have called Saudi Arabia in, in responses, a client state. What about the Saudi reaction uh, to this sort of um, sociocultural political level on Twitter, in the media, in the public pronouncements, et cetera? Yeah, I think um, especially that last term that you used uh, probably gives a good idea of like how Saudis feel about that. Um, <laughs> Uh, being called a client state at the moment when they feel like they're coming into this sort of national pride and asserting their importance and showing their um, their relevance and their strength actually in the oil market um, uh, doesn't play well domestically, obviously. Uh, Saudi Arabia has made a big play uh, about that they're not going to allow any uh, foreign states to have any say in their domestic politics, um, which is why this, this whole issue of... Uh, especially the Biden administration, uh, making a bigger deal about, uh, to some degree, about human rights and bringing up the Khashoggi issue repeatedly um, increases that uh, tension mm. with Saudi Arabia. Um, and I think, uh, as well, uh, it, it's something that they can get uh, a lot more sympathy, I think, in the current global setting and global hearing. Um, because I think there is that kind of sense that we're in this moment, and it's, I heard somebody kind of laughing and saying, what is Saudi Arabia going to be the champion of this kind of post-colonial moment right now? <laughs> Which is uh, uh, kind of hilarious, actually. But, but it is true that there is a certain moment uh, in, the, in the international arena, I think, of, of, of feeling like, you know, that, that this is somewhere a time when you can sort of test the the United States. So, I, and and that other countries shouldn't be beholden to the United States anymore. That we have our own interests. I mean, it is a nationalist era across the board. So I, I think that does play out um, in that way, and it and it makes it so that you know Saudis can very much anchor themselves in this argument about well, we have our interests in, in oil, and we don't have to take yours into consideration. Um, but I think they do, <laughs> and that's that's the problem that I think we need to really wrestle with here because um, obviously here we're talking about energy security. I think we've explained amply how this um, affects Saudi Arabia uh, very fundamentally, but 
and especially in this moment, it's affecting the entire globe. I mean, uh, this whole conflict, I think, for especially for the Biden administration, which is so focused on the Ukraine war and on, on shoring up that transatlantic partnership mm-hmm. with Europe, is super concerned about the moment that we're going to be going to in, in Europe, where we mm-hmm. know we're going to be facing a really difficult winter and to um, inject this kind of greater uncertainty or tightening of the market um, and defer to Kate on those kinds of things. Um, you know, it de- directly plays against those those tensions and those concerns about energy security. Uh, and of course, you know, Saudi Arabia is being a little bit cavalier, I think, too, about uh, their position in regional security, where they obviously, did, obviously still do have uh, important, <laughs> you know, critical ties with the United States. Yeah. So uh, I really worry that at this moment, um, you know, the Saudis were being a bit cavalier about the global situation on energy security. The response has been in the United States, okay, fine, we can play that game too, and we can be much more cavalier about your regional security. So a lot of the things that are being pitched that the mm-hmm. U.S. can do in response has to do with holding back weapons. Yeah. Um, and I think this is a really um, corrosive dynamic uh, and something that we have to think about uh, if there's any way we can get sort of beyond that sort yeah. of uh, tit for tat and the, the links of these two things that are so very fundamental to the well-being of, of both and to the globe, really, when we're talking about issues of energy security. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I think that that's exactly right. And uh, let me just say, I mean, I, I think one of the pieces of good news, uh, which there, there aren't many in this situation, but there is one, which is the Biden administration, for all of its tough talk, hasn't taken any action that is precipitate or irreversible or um, disproportionate in in, in any sense. Um, There is a postponement of a working group meeting on Iran, uh, USGCC working group. There's uh, a little bit of pressure here and there. Uh, But clearly the administration, while assuring its friends in Congress that it's going to be taking some measures and that there will be open quote consequences, close quote, has not done anything. Um, dramatic, and and specifically, it hasn't done anything irreversible. Uh, And I think that's sort of um, crucially important uh, because I still get the impression that uh, the the Biden administration, or at least the key figures in the Biden administration, are hoping to be able to sort this out with the Saudis. And there is, um, Kate, a... uh, an upcoming meeting uh, of OPEC Plus, uh, December 4, I believe, um, which could give the Saudis an opportunity, not, not even necessarily to reverse this decision, but to do whatever they do in real coordination with Washington. In other words, to, to make sure that uh, everyone is on the same page as much as possible before they do whatever it is that they do, including potentially nothing. Um, what do you look? What are you looking forward to in December? Um, do you do you think this is a key potential moment um, to start making things better, or is it just a waste of time? Uh, mm. How do you view any, any, all of it? I think I'd lose a bet if I made any bets on 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 December four. Uh, yeah, you know, it's interesting that it's taking place a day before the EU embargo on uh, Russian seaborne oil exp- oil imports by the EU com- comes into effect. With a few, you know, and that's that's really the majority of um, of um, exports to Europe. So I think there's that. There's the uh, so that has to be taken into consideration, even though it hasn't been mentioned at all. Uh, I don't know what they're going to do. I think it much depends on on where prices are at the time. I mean, if you look at Saudi Arabia and and, and Robert, you just mentioned that they're on a spending spree. I think it's like forty billion dollars a year up to 2025 that they're planning on spending. The economy is booming. I mean, I was in Saudi Arabia recently, and I don't recognize it. You know, I mean, I've been going for the last 20 years, and there is a, a sort of a dynamism. The young people are very happy. They have, uh, you know, they have a social uh, events that take place. They can go to cinemas. The restaurants are wonderful. So I think that needs to be nurtured. And, and you know, I go back to the title of, of the scene setter, the, you know, energy, uh, that, that they are at the forefront of energy security. Well, they are. I mean, if you look at where spare production capacity is, it is in Saudi Arabia. It is in the UAE. It is maybe partly in Kuwait, a little bit in Iraq, if they can uh, resolve their infrastructure issues. But they are 
now being called upon increasingly to increase production. You've seen so many people, you know, leaders from Europe, um, uh, Biden going to Riyadh, you know, against his better judgment after calling Saudi Arabia pariah. And I think they haven't forgiven that. I don't think that Saudi Arabia has forgiven being, uh, you know, referred to as a pariah and then being asked to increase production, oil production. You're not going to get much from U.S. shale producers because they are you know, they've kind of learned their lesson. They don't want to fall into debt again. So they are, uh, and, and we have to be a bit realistic as to what they are actually doing. It's not just about oil and gas. You have Qatar, which is sort of, you know, the gas supremo in, in, in the Middle East. But this session was supposed to be about hydrogen. They are going into renewables. If you look at the mm. UAE, for example, they have one of the more diversified energy um, systems in, in, in the Middle East. They've got nuclear, they've got oil, they've got gas. Uh, they're investing in blue hydrogen. Saudi Arabia is investing in neom, as you mentioned. And I think if you look at the, the, the break-even price that you spoke, I think it's going to be much higher if you take into account the fact that they're building, you know, ski resorts in the desert and the line and, you know, five billion in neom and a hundred plus billion in developing unconventional gas. So I think we are seeing a dive. And we've got to be rather pragmatic because everybody says, oh, my God, you know, oil, gas, dirty. Well, no, they are decarbonizing. They are making an effort to go into carbon capture and, and, and storage. The uh, circular carbon economy, as some of our um, attendees here are experts on, they are trying to decarbonize because at the end of the day, you're not going to jump from 20% of primary energy demand, uh, demand to 100% renewables overnight. So you are going to need oil and gas. And I think we heard yesterday from, uh, from the BP chief economist for America, you're still going to be talking about 75 to 85 million barrels a day of demand over the next few decades. So it, it you know, we are going to need Middle Eastern oil so long as you can reduce the carbon content, which they're doing. Okay, scope one and two, which doesn't really um, cover consumption on the consumer side, but it's a start. And I think they, they have the funds. Two? What is scope one and two? <laughs> scope one and two is, is you know, production, um, burning it, but not the consumption. Scope three is when you actually fill up your car and burn, okay. you know, the crude. It's not covered, but of course, you know, that's out of their hands once it goes to molecules. But I think it's, you know, it, the messaging, I think, is wrong. They're not really making a point of saying this is what we are doing. You know, you are going to need our oil, whether you like it or not. And what we're doing is we are trying to lower the carbon content. Qatar is doing it. And, you know, sort of incorporating, bringing renewables because the system at the moment is not equipped to handle. I mean, we've seen it. We've seen when the wind stops blowing in Europe, we had... Uh, you know, LNG prices went went through the roof. You're sure. seeing more demand for gas. You're you're seeing fuel switching. You're seeing coal for gas. You're seeing crude oil being burned instead of gas because gas is like you know four times more expensive at the moment. So I think the system is not um, is not ready to accommodate um, renewables. It will probably accelerate, and I think that's one of the things that might happen is as you see prices going up, uh, you will accelerate. The, the switch to renewables, but at the moment we have other issues. You know, yeah. people are being, governments are having to spend, they're having to intervene in the markets. And this whole, you know, dispute with the US doesn't help market volatility. Right. You need stability, and I don't think that's going to help. And no major power, major player is more dependent on uh, the oil from the Gulf region than, uh, than China is. And uh, US strategic dominance in the waterways of the Gulf and in the, um, in the general security climate in the Gulf uh, is a major point of leverage over China. And I, I think that often gets lost, but it's not something that um, the government doesn't know about. It's not something the, any administration will fail to register that. So if people wonder, uh, well, why, why on earth would we maintain such a military footprint? to defend these countries that don't cooperate with us on energy pricing? Well, because it's not out of altruism. Uh, there is a, uh, if you're interested in great power competition with China, uh, this is one of the uh, major Chinese vulnerabilities, and they know it, and uh, it causes them endless pain and suffering and whatnot. Uh, we have a question from the audience, and I'd encourage anyone out there who has a, a good question to uh, use the Q&A function and send it in. And I'd like to um, offer it to 
uh, Kate first, but then also Robert, um, if you'd like to uh, chime in. Um, one of our um, audience members says, given the tightness of global spare capacity and persistent up upstream underinvestment, isn't there an argument that an OPEC cut will provide a bigger spare capacity cushion and also signal that more investment is needed, both of which would help balance markets over time? It's a, it's a sort of a counterintuitive <laughs> uh, question, but a really interesting one. Well, so I, I'd ask both of you what you think about that. Yeah, obviously it does increase the, um, you know, because production capacity increased, uh, spare production capacity was shrinking as the last of the 9.7 million barrels a day was returned. Then we had that brief period where OPEC plus increased production by 100,000 barrels a day, which is really not very much when you consider it's a 100 million barrel a day market. So this was after Biden's, President Biden's visit to Riyadh. Mm -hmm. And then the, a month later, they reversed and said, we only went to do it for one month anyway. I mean, that doesn't really help. In, um, in tempering market volatility, which is what Prince Abdulaziz said was, was what he wanted because he sees a, a disconnect between the physical market and the paper market, which is where you have speculation. Um, but um, at the same time, you don't have that much new capacity coming online. If you look at Saudi Arabia, Saudi Aramco is only increasing its production capacity uh, by one million barrels a day, and that's not going to happen until 2027. So uh, so the Emirates, yes, the UAE is doing it. They're going up to 5 million. Um, I think they've even brought it forward a bit. And, and, and they will do it. And, and the, but it's not uh, the other countries aren't really doing it. Iraq has ambitions to do it, but they're, they're limited because, you know, the internal issues and so on. So I think um, the, the potential, and the problem is that as you advance with the energy transition, the you're not going to be investing in new huge gas infrastructure or oil infrastructure projects because you might end up with stranded assets when you no longer need uh, that oil. So I think, yes, I think capacity is going to be constrained for quite some time unless we can bring in more energy efficiency, unless we can, you know, don't forget there's still Africa. Africa needs more energy. They need to tap into their gas, but they're not getting the investment to do it because banks or financial institutions are no longer funding mm. fossil fuel projects. So, you know, you, you've got a huge market there and, and resources that need to be tapped that aren't being tapped. So I think it's, um, yeah, investment is not coming. Uh, and you also need a lot of investment in renewables, you know. Yeah. You need uh, huge investment. So. Robert, do you have any thoughts on this? Well, yeah, Kate did a good job with the technical components. I mean, on a broader level, uh, Kate had mentioned earlier that um, this this decision and this announcement made a big splash, and it was a it was a statement one that could have probably done with some better messaging. Um, but uh, you know, that leads me to another point that I think I'd, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention is that if we look back in the past couple of years, there are really two important trends in Saudi economic policy making that I, I think help really help us understand um, these types of decisions and these types of announcements. Uh, one is a very inward-looking, hyper-focus um, on achieving domestic um, interests or securing domestic, domestic interests and achieving national objectives. Uh, we saw that really start to emerge um, with the onset of the coronavirus pandemic in 2020. Uh, then And then that uh, continued into the economic recovery period that we saw in 2021. The second trend is this very bold and ambitious um, form of policymaking, uh, making a splash not just in energy markets, but seemingly in every other market as well, from tourism to logistics to aviation. Um, Everything uh, is, is intended to be redefined, uh, to be uh, cutting edge and to be made better. And, you know, I think we can, we can look at those two trends as, uh, as certainly reappearing in, in this context as well, in terms of how Saudi officials and policymakers are uh, engaging with energy markets and, uh, and doing it in a way that they believe is, is, is securing their own interest. Great. Oh, sure. And then I have another question for you, but go ahead. Now, I just wanted to say that, um, you know, the reaction that we're getting to that, because I, I think that there is um, a perception and it has to do with these dynamics that Robert mentioned and, and also um, kind of institutionally, the way that the Saudis have now structured their decision making in the market. Um, as I mentioned before, the much more drawing together of their domestic policy with uh, their oil policy. 
um, understandably with this uh, transition they're trying to, diversification they're trying to do inside. Um, also, we have the first time we've had a royal um, as the oil um, yeah. minister to um, the perception that the decision making is much more united now mm. at top uh, and personalized um, to a degree. So I think that um, means that, you know, as we're in this period that I, I call kind of a more national period, um, if the perception is the Saudis are going to be looking kind of toward these interests, then clearly on these most fundamental fundamental things of energy security, we are going to see the uh, consumer nations as well look to their own interests and intervene in the market right. to counter that. And, and I think that's uh, a lot of what we're seeing right now when we talk about, um, you know, using the strategic petroleum reserves, um, getting much more interventionist within the market, mm -hmm. uh, using the price cap. Um, which I'd love for Kate to explain. I think it's actually important to understand that, um, in a sense, because I think people see it as an intervention in the market, but it's in a way to be a less interventionist than what the Europeans were kind of hoping to do or something in terms of prices. So, But I, I think that's not going to end. I mean, if, if we're not getting cooperation in these markets, we're going to see a lot more of this kind of competitive uh, state bidding over things uh, within yeah. the market. Could, could you explain the two things, the price cap and, <laughs> and the, the misuse of the strategic or, or use or abuse or whatever it is of the strategic reserve? Yeah, we talked about this yesterday. You know, we strategic did. reserves are meant to be used into in, in, in events of a, of a supply shortage. And at the moment, they're being used as a price tool. Um, which isn't what they're meant to be. And of course, you know, when you when you withdraw from your strategy, you've got to fill them up again. I mean, if if you are to abide by the IEA's, you know, 90 days of, of forward cover. But I think the uh, I mean the other issue is that uh, we're we're seeing a, a the price cap is is really uh, the, the EU has agreed to a, a gas um, price a cap on gas prices, and Germany was against it because they were worried that it would actually mean that. Um, that supplies would be diverted to markets where they pay more. Um, you know, intervention is never really a good thing in a free market, and I think that's part of what's causing volatility. The price cap on, on crude oil, I mean, you know, it doesn't take into account the fact that Vladimir Putin said, you know, I'm not going to sell oil at that. But again, if you are going to have a price cap, then obviously it serves them to have a higher price because there's going to be leakage. I mean, look at Iran. Iran's been under sanctions for, for decades, and yet somehow they're still exporting, you know, 1.5 million barrels of oil a, a day, um, mostly to Asia. And, you know, these countries like India are price sensitive. So if you offer them a discount, they're going to take it. Um, you know, they'll take it from Iran. They'll take it from Russia. In fact, Indian imports of, of Russian crude went from nearly zero to nearly a million before they came down again. And they are looking around for other cheap sources because, you know, it's a, it's a huge economy and it's growing faster than China at the moment. China's price sensitive. Um, so I think we're, you know, intervention in, in, in markets by governments who don't really know markets very well mm -hmm. um, is not a good thing. And it's, it's creating more volatility, more uncertainty, and that feeds into volatility, et cetera. So... It's, um, it remains to be seen. I mean, I was talking, we were in Fujairah at this conference, and um, uh, S&P Global, who, you know, are the price benchmark people, they said, people ask us, and we just don't know. We have mm. to wait and see before we can determine how it's going to affect. Um, and, and the EU is now talking about a new benchmark as well. Yeah. Uh, for gas, which again would not be market uh, driven. driven. Right. So it's all very murky. No, I can't answer the question, but what I know is that, you know, government intervention in the free market is, is never really a good the, thing. The problem with that is that even though that's true and it may be unwise, it's also politically sometimes unavoidable because the pressure to say, take the, the strategic reserve. The pressure, whenever the price starts rising high enough, quickly enough, there's always a demand uh, to release strategic reserves in order to supposedly contain that. And so it's, it's something that can be done. And when things are going badly, we must do something. This is something, therefore, we must do it. And so, you know, uh, it's it just very difficult to avoid that. Um, I wanted to throw this one to... Um, to Kristen, if, if you want to answer it, which is um, we have a question about what impact the instability in Yemen and the threat of the Houthis 
has on Saudi calculations regarding oil because uh, of the, um, not just the instability, but the fact that there is this link between, um, you know, sort of the, uh, the, the missile attacks in general, not Abqaiq and Khuraiz, which were falsely claimed by the Houthis, but missile attacks in general and, and the, the fact that they remain very vulnerable. If you want to answer. Yeah. I'm not sure I see it exactly in the oil markets. I mean, I think it translates through the the dynamic that we kind of mentioned before uh, of that growing kind of distrust between uh, the United States and uh, Washington and Riyadh, um, where basically they, they haven't always seen eye to eye on uh, Yemen policy uh, mm -hmm. in a sense that Washington doesn't fully understand the threat that Riyadh feels they have from from the Ansar Allah kind of takeover of uh, the capital and their position inside of Yemen. And obviously Yemen has been a, 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 a thorn uh, in the side of the, the relations uh, with, with yeah. a lot of um, understandable, I think, un unease in the United States about the way that the Saudi bombing campaigns went in Yemen. Um, so I, you know, I, I think it really plays more into that. I mean, I think the economic insecurity from oil hits on the other side of, of energy yeah. diversification. I, I but I right think, uh, yeah, for the for this issue, it's it's more. Um, it would hit more on the, the security side. I, I completely agree with that. I think, that, and and on both sides, by the way, because the the question of Patriot batteries being taken out and put in and taken out, and and was there a uh, a, a sufficient or timely enough response to the um, Houthi attacks, which genuinely were Houthi missile attacks, in uh, the deadly ones in uh, Abu Dhabi um, in January. Uh, that was an another um, signal to Gulf countries that the U.S. isn't maybe um, well attuned enough to the actual threats they face, and perhaps was living in the in 1979 in the era of the. Old Carter Doctrine? Uh, I don't know. Uh, yeah, go ahead. But I think, I mean, it, it points to the, the issue, though, where, where um, you know, these historical understandings uh, of the way that we had coordination over security, you know, the Saudis feel like at this moment that we're not able or unwilling to meet their security the way that they're defining it in terms of their right. region, um, which is, is very complicated. Um, I think now we're to the issue on energy security, where we feel mm -hmm. like the Saudis aren't cooperating with us and, and meeting our needs in terms of energy security yeah. the way that we would expect. That's right. So I think it really speaks to the need for some deeper thought about if, if there are ways we can restructure, uh, maybe new institutions, new ways for, for sort of engaging mm -hmm. uh, on these critical issues. Because, uh, And I think that's part of the, the fury right now um, especially coming from the Biden administration, is, is there was a sense that over the last year, at least, uh, or so, uh, the Biden administration was engaging with Saudi Arabia, trying to get uh, an understanding and the broad sense of these issues, like, okay, well, we need to, we understand the regional security, you know, we, JCPOA mm -hmm. negotiations with Iran weren't going very well. Uh, we knew that we needed to shore up a, a deterrence um, and coordinate more with our partners there. Um, the same thing on energy, I think getting a shared understanding of what was happening in Russia, what was going to be happening in December, uh, and what we could be expecting in terms of the tightening any markets and what that meant for, you know, the, the Western partnerships. And so I think that's why there was so much fury um, with the sense that the Saudis weren't responding to this uh, right. engagement on this kind of trying to share a broad view of where we stand on, on both security and energy. Um, and that's that's a real a real problem, I think, uh, moving forward. I think I think you've raised uh, an exceptionally important issue here, which is managing uh, not not only aligning expectations but managing expectations. Right there is a there is a um, a failure to do both on both sides. I think both I, and this uh, cri current crisis over the OPEC plus decision is obvious to me that both sides expected very different things from each other and uh, are taken aback by what the other has done and said, and therefore um, expectations are completely out of whack. And that uh, is a recipe. Built on top of a deficit of trust, that's a recipe for disaster, without doubt. Um, I want to throw a really interesting question um, out there, and anyone can tackle it. 
but I would like to invite Kate uh, to take a first stab at it if you want, uh, and perhaps Robert as well, uh, and um, anybody really. But um, an anonymous attendee says, it seems the Biden administration and OPEC plus, uh, plus are both signaling the need for a crude price floor, albeit at different levels. I think this is a very good insight. Uh, Biden SPR release comes, the uh, strategic reserve, right, has comes with a signal to domestic producers that it will begin purchasing barrels to refill the reserve when it drops to 70-ish, uh, while OPEC plus wants 90-ish. So is there an opportunity for some common ground on this issue? This strikes me as a very insightful question. Um, it, you know, OPEC in the past tried to set a price bound and they never managed to stay within it. So I think they learned their lesson and stopped setting any um, any price bands or even declare what price they would prefer. But, you know, their actions speak um, for themselves, you know, that they didn't like oil prices below 85. Mm -hmm. Now they're above 90. So, you know, everybody seems to be happy. And if they, if you watch the last OPEC Plus meeting, the press conference, which incidentally was really interesting, Alexander Novak, the deputy prime minister who also seems to be in charge of OPEC affairs, even though he's no longer energy minister, was not present at the press conference, even though he was present in Vienna. So I think they they did care about the optics at the end of the day. Um, but, you know, the Russians have said that they will allow um, Saudi Arabia to speak for them. Uh, but I think Saudi Arabia and, and OPEC are becoming, they used to be very sort of, um, you, there, there used to be a lot of leaks, you know, ahead of meetings before, mm -hmm. but we haven't seen that. But I think it's become more sophisticated because if you follow the Wall Street Journal, they have used the Wall Street Journal to get some messages across, mm -hmm. i.e. there was a few months ago, there was a report that they might actually pay for oil sales to China um, by using uh, the Chinese yuan. And then... There was the other leak, basically, which is what brought this on, is when they said, OK, the Americans asked us to postpone by month. So they, they are using the US media and, let's face it, the, you know, the Wall Street Journal in particular, need I say more, to sort of send these messages to Washington. And I think that's quite interesting because it hasn't been done before. It was, you know, in the past, they would give it to some of the agencies. But um, so I think that's 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 quite an interesting thing. But I wanted to also bring, you know, the whole issue of security of, of not just energy security, but the, I think the uh, Washington is keeping the two separate. You know, the security arrangement with with the Gulf states, with with Saudi Arabia, and the other issues, you know, human rights and energy and so on. But um, it's I think that's. That's quite an interesting time. I don't think you're going to have a total breach in, in, in that relationship because it's too important. But I wanted to also ask you, maybe, Hussein, because mm -hmm. you've covered this before. You've seen the UAE go the, uh, the other direction. You know, they've now got the, they're part of the Abraham Accords, mm -hmm. which also provides a, an umbrella of security for them yeah. uh, through an alliance with, with Israel. And I wanted to, to get, you know, is that something that, um, that you see is, is relevant? Um, to the price of oil probably not no. in <laughs> <laughs> no, I meant to, to, to security, security yes yeah. yes of course it is uh, I mean in other words I think I think it, it, it's a reflection of the fact that um, US traditional US partners in the region uh, Tutkor, all of them uh, that, that, that have been particularly close security partners with the United States have developed for different reasons but across the same time frame. Uh, in other words, really in the past 15 years or so, uh, a growing sense that it is simply unwise to rely on Washington in, in the way that your fundamental uh, national security b uh, basis is the Americans will save us in the end. Uh, and I think this applies to Israel, it applies to Saudi Arabia, it applies to the UAE, uh, and mainly those three countries. Uh, and I think you've seen all three of them um, emphasizing strategic diversification, um, both uh, regionally, and the Abraham Accord is, is one of the most dramatic examples of that, but there are many others, the rapprochements with uh, Turkey, uh, the UAE and, and, um, and Saudi Arabia, the uh, outreach to Iran by UAE and, and Saudi Arabia, uh, increased uh, cooperation between Saudi Arabia and Israel under the table, but also the fact that all three of those countries, Israel, 
Saudi Arabia and the UAE have gotten in trouble with the United States. Um, Israel, more trouble than any, uh, on any other issue at all um, in the past decade because of close links to China. Um, it links involving uh, technology transfer, potential technology transfer, dual-use facilities like the, the uh, port in, in the UAE that was supposedly a dual-use port, um, the question of, of 5G technology and information technology, especially the role of Huawei, which, which uh, many Americans fear could have um, uh, intelligence, uh, signals intel, uh, and other kinds of uh, surveillance um, ca capabilities hardwired into it in a way that people can't even find out that they're there or not. Um, so all of that has been a big factor in, number one, strengthening the security profile of these countries, right, uh, in the sense that it really has made them, uh, I think, all three of them stronger and, and uh, more robust um, in terms of their defense and, and strategically. On the other hand, it has undermined all three of their relationships with Washington. And it, 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 so it depends how clever you are in defending yourself when the, when the uh, crisis hits. I think the Israelis are much better at reading the room in Washington and managing Washington than the other two countries are. But I also think they're, they have uh, an asset the other two don't, which is a, a set of domestic constituencies that will go to bat for them politically. The evangelicals on the one hand, Jewish Democrats on the other hand, and, and others. No. Um, but I, I was going to argue, think, sorry, no. I was going to oh, argue that there is an energy security aspect because because of the Abraham Accords, you yeah. now have UAE company investing in offshore gas, um, Israeli offshore yeah. gas. They are present and you have the Qataris are present yeah. in, in the East Mediterranean. So you're seeing the beginnings of a sort of, you know, East Mediterranean regional um, energy security. Um, that's, I think that that's right. Uh, it's also been, um, uh, you know, the kind of the rapprochements between Gulf countries and Turkey have been also part of an effort, I think, to normalize Turkey's relations, um, which theoretically should have had a calming impact on the Eastern Med LNG arguments. Uh, and I do think the, the fact that, that um, uh, there has been a generalized turn away from uh, conflict and confrontation in the region that was kicked off really by the Abraham Accords and has been pushed uh, probably more aggressively by UAE than anybody else in the region, but also you know participated in by the Saudis, by the uh, Turks and others, um, uh, helped to set the context for the Israeli-Lebanese uh, uh, dual agreements with the United States on their maritime border, which not only ought to make it possible for both countries to more freely exploit those resources and bring them online, but also prevent a conflict. I mean, it appears that Hezbollah is signing off on this, mm -hmm. yeah. and that should help lower the temperature. Uh, whether it saves the Lebanese from themselves domestically, economically, is it a whole other matter. But uh, I think you're right about all of that. Did you want to add something? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, um, just to round out the question about the um, price uh, floor and the ceiling. I, yeah. You know, uh, the energy transition is, is going to be very uneven. There's a lot of volatility and, uh, I mean, directly linked to geopolitical um, you know, uncertainty about geopolitical events. Uh, this, of course, creates a lot of challenges for a net exporter like Saudi Arabia, but it's also a big problem for um, net importers, countries like China, to bring the conversation back to China. Now, China has um, experimented with, uh, with, with price floors and with ceilings because they don't want, you know, it's, it's not good for business and for the economic development model for prices to be too low or for too high. You know, for some time, um, the development model in China seemed to be uh, working pretty well, but uh, certainly of late we see a number of cracks and, uh, and issues with, uh, with the trajectory of economic development in the country. So I I'm not so sure that uh, we're going to be rushing uh, anytime soon to implement um, price floors or ceilings uh, here you know, in the U.S. Yeah, no, uh, thank you so much for that. Uh, we, we have a, a question about, um, which is, I think, uh, a very interesting one, 
um, uh, which posits that there's been a breakdown in effective dialogue between the Biden administration and the government in Riyadh. And in the past, the energy secretary took the lead on OPEC diplomacy, but it appears now to be relegated to lower level White House advisors. I think that's true. Um, so is there a way to rewire, elevate better communication on energy with KSA? And I would just add to that, given that the president is not going to do it, given that Biden is, is not going to be doing this again, I, in my view. I think we can, we can put that off to some future date as, a, as, an, as an aspiration. Would anybody like to, to tackle that? It's complicated, but no. <laughs> I mean, I, I, would, I would simply say that, that this, and, and then, yeah, if Kristen could, could add something. I mean, I think you can see differences in um, styles uh, between Democratic and Republican administrations. And one of the stylistic flaws of recent Democratic administrations has been the, the lack of focus on having a very specific point person on these kind of volatile issues. Um, and that was certainly true in both Obama terms on many key issues, not all of them. And it's been true of the Biden administration as well. Uh, and I think, generally speaking, it's been easier to know uh, during Republican administrations who's in charge of what policy, except the chaotic Trump administration, which made very little sense on anything. And it was all just, you know, government by tweet. So that's a whole other uh, stylistic flaw. Um, so I, I think that's something that would be very important to correct. Yes, I think there should be at least a cabinet level person handling this. For sure, energy secretary would be a good idea. It's gotten to the point where I think the president ought to be the one um, really sort of in charge, but that, that's not going to happen. He's because he, he feels burned. He didn't he, he, he had his doubts about the outreach, and uh, he probably feels confirmed in those doubts, probably uh, um, in a way that is analogous to other presidents with other volatile issues that don't bring successes immediately. Uh, Hussein, just to color in the political baseline and anybody else who wants to um, mention it, um, is there a difference uh, in the way that the um, Saudis responded to the Biden administration in the way that they responded to similar demands from the Trump administration. Did, did former President Trump make demands of them about production cuts or pricing, um, and they responded in a different way, or uh, he didn't, that administration didn't make those kinds of demands? And in general, there, of course, a whole history behind that of other administrations. Was there something different in this particular um, situation? I, do you remember? Yeah, I remember. Yeah, okay. No, they ahead. Totally. Yeah. Okay, Kristen, go ahead. No, I mean, I, I think the history is, is replete with Americans, uh, presidents asking the Saudis to intervene in the, in the market. We, we, we regularly have done that. And I remember um, President Trump during that um, period, and it was 2020, I'm sure Kate can, 2020, can, yeah. can get it more. When Saudi had the presidency, and Trump was responsible yeah. for yeah, and directly or making it happen, it and um, did get a positive response. Um, which I again, I think, um, and this is the problem with like putting point people, like saying like hey, we need a point person to go there. I mean, the problem is that the policy in, in Riyadh is one person too, right. <laughs> um, and so I think we do have to calculate, and that that's part of the issue here is that there's a sense that you know issues of like peak between. The administrations and stuff can affect now oil, oil policy. I mean, that's like uh, really, really uh, dangerous. And I, I don't think we were in that situation as much before. Uh, well, the stakes are different now, right? The Ukraine yeah. war changes everything. The, the threat of a global recession is really, I mean, it's ominous in a way that it hasn't been. No, and I, and I think this whole issue about uh, when, when we release the strategic petroleum reserve, I mean, a little bit far from my area, but, I mean, the, the stock's really low. I mean, the, the prices would have gone, I mean, correct me, I mean, up oh, 150. Yeah. If we wouldn't have done that, that, that would be a global recession, much less what it would happen just to the American economy. So I think uh, the competitiveness uh, is... is uh, Obviously, yeah. very concerning, um, and, and, it, and it affects not just these two countries, but the entire kind of global um, right. uh, economic, global economy at, at this point. I mean, we are on the edge of a global recession. And there is no doubt that for about the first three years of his administration, 
Um, President Trump had a much better relationship with Riyadh than, than President Biden has, has ever had. Um, I think that changed towards the end, but yeah. Sorry, you were going to... Uh, yeah. No, I was going to say, you know, it's not... Uh, Chris mentioned that for the first time we actually have a, a member of the Saudi royal family as, as minister. And it's not just because he's a member of the royal family and, and half-brother to, um, to the crown prince. He actually is um, somebody who is very experienced. Now, he's been doing this job for a long time. He was deputy minister... Uh, under several um, ministers in the past. So he actually knows the market. He knows mm. what he's doing. If you talk to him, you mention a field or you mention that, and he knows the history. He doesn't even need to refer to funds. So he's a highly experienced. He knows. And I think he must have known what the impact would be of this decision, even if it's from quotas as opposed to actual production. And they have in the past. I mean, OPEC has in the past b b sort of... B b b regularized either overproduction or under well underproduction not so much but this is what they've done at the moment they've basically uh, legitimized the underproduction and said okay you know we'll just cut a bit more but in the past they would have done it as swing producers they would have done it quietly and they would have tweaked it and they're still talking about tweaking it if necessary and what's interesting about this last meeting is they're not going to be meeting as regularly they're going to and they have extended the actual quotas to the end of 2023 in order to provide stability to the market and tweak if necessary, which again is sort of, you know, it's something they've never done before, and mm. particularly with prices at about $90. That's where yeah. it's, it's a bit unusual. Um, we have a series of questions that I think can be conflated into one big question, which is what about other Gulf countries, right? What's the role of, um, of, of, say, the UAE as a potential mediator here? What's the role of Oman with regard to re reducing uh, tensions with Iran? What's the role of Kuwait as another significant producer? I mean, are they... And what about the fact that um, Saudi Arabia is taking all the blame for a, what is in technically at least a collective OPEC plus decision? These are, these are a set of questions. I would throw them out to the whole panel and anybody who wants to tackle any part of that or anything related to it, go right ahead. Shall I begin with a, shall. a really modest uh, bite here? Um, but, well, let me just focus on the UAE, because uh, if we look at the UAE, we can see that um, the economic development plans and strategies taking place in the UAE are in many respects, kind of um, ramping up the regional competition, competition and raising the stakes for Saudi Vision 2030 uh, and all of the ambitious uh, mega projects and initiatives that are taking place in the kingdom. So not only do the Saudis have the domestic, um, you know, have, have domestic interests to, uh, to consider and to, to advance, but they're, of course, looking at other countries uh, in the region, and I'd say first and foremost is the UAE, which on a number of fronts, when you're talking about tourism or special eco economic zones and free zones or being a logistics hub, aviation, in many respects um, does have the, uh, the lead and is more established in these markets. And this, this raises the stakes for, for Saudi Arabia and its, uh, and its economic um, transformation. So... I mean, this is this gets away a little bit from the energy markets and, and brings us back more into the broader um, political economy of the region. But uh, I, I would say that this is another very important consideration to keep in mind that the there is certainly um, a an element of regional uh, competition. At times, it's healthy competition. At sometimes, it's a little less healthy. But you're talking at the end of the day uh, about relatively homogenous economies, um, all looking. Uh, with some level of concern at the energy transition and where their position is in the future um, in this you know, post-oil economy that we hear uh, quite a lot about, but obviously we're not there yet. I was going to add that, you know, if you look at the way things have happened, if you look at the recent statements by the UAE minister, I mean, they basically um, support the Saudi decision. Uh, even the Iraqi Ministry of Foreign Affairs actually issued a statement in support of the uh, OPEC agreement, even though the prime minister designate had earlier said he didn't think that Iraq should cut because they need the funds. So I think Saudi Arabia def definitely runs a show. I think the others fall into line. There's, as you say, there's a bit of sibling rivalry, um, uh, you know. It, it, but if you look at the statement that was issued by OPEC after the previous meeting, it was 
almost identical to the words used by Prince Abdulaziz bin Salman, the Saudi minister. So basically, I don't think there's any doubt as to who uh, runs the show. I think there's uh, they're they're all falling in line. I mean, it used to be that the Gulf states at previous OPEC meetings, I've been covering it for decades, would sit together and come up with a common uh, position. Um, and uh, but I think now it's more a, a question of you know Saudi Arabia, it, its Saudi agenda. Moscow falling in because, I mean, at the end of the day, it's a consensus agreement, so they all have to agree, otherwise there's no agreement. But I don't think there's any doubt as to um, as to who's actually in charge at the moment. And, you know, it is uh, it is a mandate that they have, that they, that they want to, um, you know, to get the best out of it while they can, you know. It's, it's make hay while the sun shines, and we know that the transition's coming. It may not happen overnight, but we need... We need to, uh, and as I think um, uh, Anne Sophie mentioned yesterday at, in the gas session, despite all these investments in blue hydrogen, green hydrogen, pink, white, whatever, I mean, there's so many colors of the rainbow, they're still not going to be getting the same rent uh, as from oil sales. So I think, you know, high oil prices, let's do it now. But, you know, what it's doing to the global economy and the fact that you're actually precipitating maybe helping push the recession forward a bit and then also which is going to hit demand. So I think they've got to balance their need for their own revenues to balance their own budgets and at the same time um, make sure that prices are not that high that they cause even more damage to, to demand. I was just going to say, uh, obviously, a lot of the messaging coming out has been about how this was a collective decision. The Saudis have been trying to underline that. Um, they've had all of their partners come out and say this was a collective decision. Um, I just think it didn't carry as much weight um, in Washington because we were reading the, the counter messaging that was going underneath and because of the reality that Kate, uh, I think Gulf Watchers kind of recognized that reality. Um, it is interesting, though, as a kind of show of force that the Saudis were were able to get this support um, in the aftermath of or, or during this uh, kind of political conflict of having all of these statements. And I, again, I think that's part of the Saudi show of force that we yeah. have. We have strong partnerships in the region. Uh, we can go to people. and We can have them. Uh, stand up with us. Did you just see that Turkey as well had issued yeah. a yes. statement? Yes. Tur yes. Even Turkey? Yes. The Turkish foreign minister the said, Turkish foreign ministry, said I think. the U.S. should not bully Saudi Arabia on oil prices. Yeah. That was his word, was that's bully. That's correct. Yeah. So, I mean, obviously, that's also part of this uh, Saudi show of, of power right. on the, the global stage um, that they have uh, partners. And uh, But I do think the strategy, too, is also a, 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 a tactic, because I think the mm -hmm. U.S. strategy would be to kind of look for if the Saudis aren't going to be sympathetic on these key issues, and I think we would be looking to other partners and to see if we can, uh, you know, I don't want to say like cause divisions, but I mean, effectively yeah. in policy, yeah. um, reason with uh, other partners and, and mm -hmm. to see what sort of uh, agreements can be made to or at least to engage them to yeah. get them to engage on a different level with the if, Saudis. If, yeah. you, if you think breaking the cartel would be useful, you would try to do it. Um, uh, the, one of the accusations that the White House has floated against um, uh, Saudi Arabia is the accusation that it coerced uh, other OPEC Plus members into going along. Also, uh, Kirby, um, who's the government spokesman here, John Kirby, had uh, said several times rather pointedly that there were other countries that did not agree uh, with um, Saudi Arabia privately, but they had to go along as, because as Kate was saying, it's, it's unanimous or it's not unanimous. And there are all these reports that uh, the, the UAE's national security advisor, Tahnun, went to, um, uh, went to Riyadh to, to try to talk them out of it or, uh, or get them to delay and, and was, um, was unsuccessful. So there's all of that. Um, I, I, we're just about out of time. We got, we got an interesting question uh, about uh, how Saudi Arabia might respond to a Chinese attempt to seize Taiwan. I want to answer that very quickly. <laughs> I mean, I think we know. We've just seen it in yeah. Ukraine. We try to do as little as possible. They would try to stay out of it. But if President Biden is right and the U.S. would deploy forces directly in the conflict, they would be even less successful in that, in that context and staying out of it than they have been uh, in this context. I think that would apply to Israel and it would apply to uh, uh, the UAE as well. So um, uh, we're almost out of time, but I'd like to give everybody a chance to not just to make a closing comment, but there, you know, again, I'm going to synthesize a bunch of questions. 
a best case and a worst case scenario for how this goes in the next six to 12 months, right? Uh, and let's go around, let's begin with, with Robert and then uh, Kristen and Kate, and if I have anything to add, I will. Okay, thank you, Hussein. Um, well, I guess the best case scenario would be some, some way for the White House and the Saudis to reconcile what I see as competing political and economic urgencies associated um, with, uh, with energy markets. And that, that's how I open my, my remarks, and I guess that's how I will close them, that there is a, seems to be a real political urgency here in Washington with respect to how um, we use instruments to impact uh, energy prices. Uh, and that's, as I said, it's, it's, it's very, at the end of the day, comes down to um, achieving political objectives. On the Saudi side, I see it, and maybe that's my bias as a, a political economist, but I see it as the urgency at the end of the day comes down to, uh, is one of, of economic, uh, it's, it's economic in nature. So uh, there's certainly a way to, to find a balance between those two, and um, I don't have a good answer for that, but that is the direction I would point uh, both parties to head in, to find the solution. I mean, I would agree, but I'd also say if you want to look on the ground, worst case, um, we're probably going to see it play out. I mean, it's a pretty kind of frightening situation, I would say, if we're going to have um, tight markets right now on the eve of the sanctions coming in in Europe. Um, that's basically handed leverage over to Russia the way that I read this. Um, we can see we know that they've been playing politically as well in markets, um, obviously, for obvious reasons. Um, you know, this could play out very, very badly uh, in Europe and, and in the United States um, and in the global economy uh, on top of that. So that obviously would not be an outcome that would be good for anyone. And I think also wouldn't be good for Saudi Arabia. It's going to put them under incredible, even increased political pressure. And um, and if the markets actually do, uh, the global markets, you know, go down, that's not going to help them overall in terms of their energy sales. So um, I think... You know, we're going to have an experiment to see sort of what worst case scenarios will mm. could look like. Um, and I, I would just say in terms of looking forward, something that we could do. I, I really enjoyed the um, listening to the discussion yesterday. And I wanted to highlight uh, a small piece that Robert Robin, sorry, Robin Mills, uh, or not as a scholar who spoke yesterday, also wrote for us, uh, trying to push forward, uh, thinking about ways that we can reconfigure our coordination. Um, and this would apply, I think, to all of the Gulf states, not just Saudi Arabia, on energy markets in this important transition period. Um, we do have uh, our, 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 our shared future is going to be tied together in that transition uh, and having some kind of new vehicles to allow them to communicate in different ways. Institutional vehicles, I think we should talk about that link in not only the concerns of these producers as they are kind of winding down or winding lower with oil, but also their transition and in, in increasing uh, other kind of alternative uh, uh, energy sources and, and having more cooperation on that level might be a way to find an area of cooperation that would benefit everyone. And I just wanted to uh, recommend that you look at his piece. Well, I was going to say that, you know, when you listen to people who are in the know, who know Russia, um, you know, they all expect that Russia is not going to be the sort of... Uh, it's going to be a spent force when, when this is said and done. We're not seeing any, any unless something really dramatic happens, which we hope doesn't. And I think putting your eggs in that basket is probably a big mistake. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, there is more interest in, in particularly on the security front, on, on various fronts. I mean, when you look at your, your currencies in the Gulf, uh, mostly pegged to the, to the U.S. dollar, investments in, in, in the United States. I mean, there's a lot to lose if you go one direction or the other. Uh, and, you know, I'm going to be a cheerleader for Robin Mills as well. I read a very interesting article he wrote yesterday basically saying, you know, you need pragmatism to ensure global energy security. Mm -hmm. I think it was in, in a, a website that I've never seen before. It's Reaction, if anybody knows it. But no. it's an excellent piece, and it basically, well, you know, it tells it as it is. You know, you are in a, in a transitional period, and I think you need to... Uh, 
you know, you need to know who your friends are and right. you can't sort of suddenly switch. It's not a playground. Yeah. And I think a lot of the attitude that I've seen from, from some of these old producing states is, you know, we told you so. You kept telling us you don't need our oil. Well, look at what's happened now. Yeah. You know, you've got to put that aside and say, okay, you know, it is in the best interests of our economies, yeah. but also in the economies of, of the consumer nations. And you cannot ignore America. But I think the elections in November, the congressional elections, are going to have a big part in, in what happens happens next yeah I mean it'll be um, uh, it'll be very um, it'll make matters worse if the Democrats lose the Senate uh, because then they're going to be looking for who to blame and uh, OPEC plus and Saudi Arabia are going to be high on that list well uh, I also want to um, praise Robin Mills. I think he's great. Uh, I've been been an admirer of his for a long time because um, he writes about this stuff in, in a way that I can understand it, which is yeah. some kind of an amazing feat because I don't understand this stuff. But but yeah, I, I get what he says. You too, Kate, by the way. Um, there are these small number of people who can actually explain this uh, mis mystery to me. All right, uh, I, I'm going to say a uh, worst-case scenario would be you know, major political tensions, right? The Democrats lose the Senate. The, the Saudis welcome Xi Jinping with pomp and ceremony. Not only that, there are major deliverables. And uh, there are uh, sort of tit for tat, um, not sanctions, but, but um, uh, you know, anti-deliverables between the United States and, and Saudi Arabia, which push the differences to... Uh, uh, limits rather further than we've seen. However, um, like I think Kate is implying, uh, at least I would go, I would be blunt and say, uh, I think the two countries are still stuck together. Fundamentally, the United States offers Saudi Arabia a level of security support that it can't get from anywhere else, uh, even if it wanted China to come to the rescue. Uh, let's, let's get back to me when China is in control of the North and South China Seas. And then we can talk about the Strait of Hormuz, right? It is not realistic. Um, more than that, I think if the United States wants to remain a, a serious global player, its security position in the Gulf region uh, is a major asset, including in great power competition with China. It needs a local partner. Iran is not a plausible uh, local partner because it's an anti-status quo Revisionist power does not share U.S. goals on anything other than al-Qaeda and ISIS, and that's not much. Um, and uh, Iraq is a broken country, and there really is only one major force that isn't a city-state, isn't um, fundamentally at odds with the United States, and isn't, um, uh, you know, in, in great disrepair, and that would be Saudi Arabia. So I think in the end, this um, pure pragmatism and pure national interest drives these countries back together again and again and again. And that's why the relationship has lasted for 80 years. It's not because this is one of the strangest long-term partnerships in modern human history, I think, because the amount of distrust and, and, and skepticism and even sometimes dislike between the two societies has been remarkably high, whereas the mutual dependency has been higher and I think that's likely to continue to be the case. So either way, whether we go through a, a relatively quick rapprochement or we force ourselves into all kinds of torment and torture and we pull our teeth out with pliers and drive nails into our feet um, or not, uh, we're going to end up back, uh, I think, in a, in a very cooperative relationship because I really don't think there's much of a choice on either side. And um, I'll end there. And I'll say thank you so much to everybody who's been watching us. And uh, back to Doug. So I'm going to jump on the bandwagon of praise for Robin Mills. And uh, again, <laughs> let everybody, remind everybody that Robin this week uh, published a paper in conjunction with this uh, conference, OPEC Plus to Cut Production, but Should Heat Energy Market Shifts, available on AGS and Abuse website. But really to thank Kate, Kristen, Robert, and Hussein for a fascinating cap to yesterday's day of detailed and deep economic analysis. Um, I don't think we gave any definitive answers, but what I hope we have given all of you in the audience is a deeper understanding of the dynamics, both political and economic. Um, and I can guarantee you that AGSIW will continue to cover all of these issues in writing, in both English and Arabic, and in our programs. 
Um, I hope you've all enjoyed our new and improved hybrid format that we are working with now so that we can be both here in our offices in Washington and reach out across the world with our messages and our analysis. Uh, as always, everything will be available to you in the audience at agsiw.org. Uh, until we meet again in person or online, I want to thank you all for attending, and farewell for now from Washington, D.C.